Sometimes when we're fearful or when we really don't like an animal, they will come to us um, as a deliberate attempt to try to convert us. And the classic example of this is cats. People who don't like cats will walk into a room and any cat around will go to that person. <laughs> and that's very often because they are saying, oh, you know, I see this and I'm going to just try and teach you otherwise. So there can be many reasons why, why they do. But yes, the moment there's fear, they can sense that as well. And, and when fear is around, then it's impossible to be present, to be fully present. Those two are mutually exclusive. So animals are very present. When we bring fear into the situation, we're not very present. And that just is a bad start to a relationship in a moment and, and to relating. I'm sure that your work with your rabbit, though, is absolutely in an ongoing way beyond the rabbit moments transformed your inner reality and the dog is picking that up. As a brief aside, if dogs are jumping up or if animals are doing things with their bodies that uh, you're concerned about perhaps hurting you or guests who arrive, and if you are suggesting to animals what they should do instead, like you want the dog to not jump up anymore, it's always important to phrase the message in the positive. So if a dog's coming towards me and jumping up and going to knock me over, it's not a good idea for me to say, don't jump up, don't jump up. Because unconsciously, I've got the quantum holograph or the mental image of the dog jumping. I'm just reinforcing that. And the don't gets lost along the way. The universe doesn't understand don't. Rather think of the positive version of what you would like them to do and suggest that. So I always say, keep all four feet on the ground, all four feet on the ground. And then they get that. They're like, oh, oh okay. And still allow them to greet you like dogs want to do. But always suggest things in the positive rather than the double negative. Great. Hi. Yeah. Um, the story of Diablo spirit um, is hugely, you know, effective and, and, mm. and impressive. Um, but what strikes me about it is the effect that you were able to have on that leopard um, when the people who owned it, obviously mm. cared about it already mm. very hugely. Mm. So it rather suggests that you have genuinely exceptional abilities, mm -hmm. and although I applaud your intention to try to increase people's awareness, change their attitudes towards animals and mm -hmm. nature, have you ever met anybody who is as good as you are? Number one. <laughs> Number two, um, <laughs> I'm, I, I sat at dinner with Alistair Black, who told me that you were working with one of his colleagues, mm -hmm. taking people on safari into wilderness areas. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd be curious about you know what, what the plan is or what the intention is there. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, I'm wondering if um, if animals are aware of humans and you know poaching type humans, mm -hmm. and whether there's anything that can be done. Um, with the animals mm -hmm. to shift that situation. Mm. Great, thank you. I'll try to remember all of those three. <laughs> if you don't, I remind you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I don't have exceptional abilities. However, this is my passion and my calling, and so I've paid a lot of attention and time to it in the last 12 years since I jumped ship from my IT career into doing this and finally followed my bliss. So perhaps the combination of really combining my passion with this as a calling has put me in the position of doing the right thing for me and and therefore you know it's it's also something i do every day so i'm much more practiced and practice does make perfect it really does yes i do have colleagues around the world other animal communicators um, who are as good as me if you want to use that terminology which is a strange sense to me that we often um check in with each other around difficult situations or really dire situations where a rhino is you know, badly injured and there's poaching and that sort of thing. And we always get exactly the same messages in our communications. So we sort of double check each other, if I can put remotely. it that way. Excuse remotely. Me? remotely? Yes, remotely. Yes. Yeah, remotely. I'll talk about more about the remote thing in a moment. So um, about uh, Diablo renamed Spirit, yes, the people did care about him very much and they were desperate to try to um, have him be happy and try to have him come out of his night shelter. And that desperation of theirs is not unlike the question about fear that we just had. That desperation comes with a certain anxiety and it's just focused on what they want him to do. You know, come out, come out, albeit for his own good. What also is not mentioned in the documentary is that that is an animal park where they conduct daily tours and the tour guides script 
was to keep on telling Diablo's uh, sad story. And so several times a day in front of his night shelter where no one could see him anyway, there were words being said about you know, abused in the European zoo and so unhappy and depressed and aggressive. So this was being reinforced several times a day, day after day after day. And um, with, with the best of intentions, they were inadvertently making his situation worse by throwing those sorts of feelings at him. And I'm really just an interpreter or translator. It's not, uh, you know, yes, animals tend to trust me maybe because of my um, willingness to be on the same wavelength as them. And the work I've done to clear myself of projections or expectations or prejudices against species. So perhaps I'm a bit more of a clear container because of personal spiritual work I've done on myself, but I'm really just the interpreter. That was all just about me conveying his message to his keepers. And Jörg, right that same day, decided, he went to the tour guides and he said, you will never ever again say a negative word about him or tell his sad past and tell his story. We're going to scrap that from the script and we're going to rename him and that's it. And it was because Jörg and the staff did that, that spirit responded so positively and then gave that feedback. Mm. So, the second question was? The wilderness trips. Oh yes, the wilderness trips, yes. Um, Peter Raimondo is a wilderness guide in South Africa and we run wilderness trails that are between seven and ten days long. What is very special about being in the wilderness and communicating with animals telepathically is that it's very, very different, again, to how a lot of the animals experience humans in the tourist sense. Even on safaris, there's people with cameras who want something from them. They want the photograph or they want to point at them and they just see them as objects. Here we go on foot, we sleep under the stars, no tents, no communications. We are literally humbling ourselves and making ourselves no greater than the animals. And we will inevitably have encounters with them on foot, but we don't, well, although we are looking after you know, safety and, and possible interaction dynamics, we're very much about connecting with the animals and their truths and understanding from them how they're feeling about our presence and do they want us to move away or move around. And just on the last trip back in March, we had an incident, which was a very hot day, about 42 degrees Celsius. Very hard to imagine in the Scottish summer. <laughs> and we were desperate. In fact, we needed to gather water from the river to be able to drink. We completely ran out of water. But a bull elephant was 100 meters back from the water and he really, really wanted to get in as well. He was nervous of us. We were perhaps more nervous of him and he had every right of way. We wanted to make sure he could go. But he conveyed to me he was still very, very nervous and would rather hang back. So I said to him telepathically across the river a great distance, I said, OK, well, we'll also just sit here quietly. When I turned my attention away, some of the men decided to go into the river. They couldn't wait any longer. And the first I knew about it was this um, perturbed message from the elephant basically saying, hey, you broke the deal. You know, and the people are in the water now, you broke the deal. And he began flapping his ears and wanting to mock charge. So I apologized immediately and explained that I had not actually conveyed that to the men. My bad, I didn't tell the other humans that I'd made that deal with the elephant. They had changed their minds without knowing any different. And so I called them out of the water. And he were right away transformed. He understood that it had been a mistake in the human communication. And he was then very happy to come down to the water to do his business and then move away so that we could have a turn. And there's lots of encounters with wildlife, um, injured or otherwise, who will often take very close contact when they know that the human is being genuinely respectful and honoring their needs and their wishes. So those wilderness trails are all about being in a very five sensory way in the wilds um, with nature on a completely even footing, so to speak. We don't have any other privileges, um, we don't have any superiority over them, and the encounters are very close and very wonderful, because once again they're truly seen, and when it's being, meeting being in nature, we too are just like another animal on the landscape. And it feels like I imagine being one of our native ancestors might be, where there's a very real relationship with the earth, with the waters, with the animals. We have baboons roosting next to us if we choose to camp on some cliff faces. Just amazing. For those who might be interested, the next trail is from the 10th until the 16th of October and details are on the website, animalspirit.org. Yeah. And your last question about poaching. Every 80 minutes in South Africa, a rhino is poached. We really don't have many left. And several other species are losing their lives as well because of people hunting them for their ivory. And 
and myself and other communicators help where we can. However, the problem is we don't know from which direction the danger is going to come. And nowadays, a lot of the poaching is done from helicopter. Within 25 minutes, the whole thing has been started and finished. They drop the poachers with their guns from helicopter. They saw off the animals' horns and then get back in the helicopter and it's all over within 25 minutes. Interspecies communication, telepathic communication has been very helpful in warning animals. So I often am involved in warning animals about farmers who want to shoot them or where there might be traps or fence lines or busy roads or if we know there's a weak point on the border of a reserve to ask the animals to avoid that area and literally visualize them moving to a different part of the reserve. Last week, while I was sitting here writing, I was involved with a white lion project in South Africa who were introducing two new lionesses from a different reserve. And if they meet the existing lions too soon, it could be a real bloodbath and many lions would be killed. Um, and they didn't want to have to sedate and anesthetize the, the resident lions while they brought in the others, because they had to go through the reserve to get to the, the enclosed area. So they asked me to communicate with the resident lions and ask them to, for that day to please move all the way to the northeastern corner of their reserve. So I sat here in Ferndorn at 58 degrees north <laughs> and imagined myself at 34 degrees south and imagined the direction northeast from that reserve, what northeast would be in terms of quality of light at a certain time of day. And just using my intention to call up those specific three lions, I asked them to please move away, move away, move towards the northeast and to stay there until sunset. And I got feedback saying that's exactly what they did. I also described to the lions why they should do that. It needs to make sense for them. That they need to want to do it for their own reasons. So it's not just because we asked them, they should do it. I explained that if they didn't do that, they would have to be darted and go through the stress and go to sleep and then be groggy for a few days. So that them agreeing to do this would be much more comfortable for them. And that's why they did agree. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Um, Hi. You talked about uh, a lot of vertebrates, mammals and mm. birds, and one very big fish. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering what experience you have or thoughts you have about the mind or contact with some of the insects. Mm. Uh, but um, in particular, I'm thinking the hive creatures like mm. ants and bees where, well, some of the bees, where um, the individual has one state of being, but then it's also part of mm. a much greater whole, I guess everything is, but mm. um, yeah, it, it, have you experience of communicating with, say, a colony of ants mm. and an individual ant and mm. yeah, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked. In fact, Dorothy and I were speaking about this the other evening, comparing notes on our communications with insects. Um, connecting with an individual insect is a wonderful thing to do. In fact, connecting with any species that you don't know a lot about is a really great thing to do because then you come to experience their reality in a way that you don't have preconceptions about. So you know it isn't your mind just suggesting things to you. So choose any insect. Go out into your garden and choose an insect to connect with and simply ask them, what is it like to see through your eyes? And I guarantee you, we have the most amazing experience of this mosaic vision and jigsaw puzzle-like experience. Um, yes, animals that live together in flocks or swarms or hives or herds for that matter, they are in the same moment aware of themselves as an individual and what they are doing and how they're feeling. And also their um, collective identity and what role they play in the collective. And it's as if they're a particle in the ocean of that collective and they move for the benefit, of the benefit of the collective. Every decision they make in a moment about which flower to go to is informed by the collective impulse and the collective good, something us humans could definitely learn from. When I was doing my advanced training in this about 12 years ago, there were six of us communicators at a wildlife ranch in Texas that was filled with African animals, very strange. And there was a whole herd of impala and we were all asked to separately go in different directions and to ask different individual impala exactly the same questions about herd life, about decisions they made about the herd and the group collective. I always remember <laughs> one answer. The question was, what do you do when you get stressed? So there's six communicators asking six different impala, what do you do when you get stressed? And all of us got exactly the same answer, which was just eat grass. <laughs> and they weren't talking about marijuana. <laughs> they essentially meant get back to basics, you know, just go back to basics. So there's a beautiful pulse of wisdom going through a collective 